uh, you know, had to leave Rome, but still thinking about Eckhart, learning more things. And uh, th- during those days, I, I did come across a number of books on Eckhart from Wolfgang Smith. Of course, Vertical Ascent wasn't uh, out yet, but I was writing then smaller papers on Eckhart. I wrote this one, Could God Create a Better World? And it kind of tracks what Wolfgang Smith presents in stating that, but let us get back to our icon, which implicates a very different worldview from the scientism and material world. The first thing is to observe is that the creative act has lost its status of long ago, for not only is the center outside the circle of time, but it is in fact equidistant to all the points on the periphery. So even here, every here and every now participates equally in that transcendent act, which is in its own right, is, is one and indivisible. One is able thus to understand that even though this, that the center is nowhere in space or time, it is yet a sense ubiquitous. In the words of Dante, it is where, everywhere, and every when are focused. It's interesting to note that um, you know, Dante was almost an exact contemporary of uh, Meister Eckhart, so it's kind of that zeitgeist uh, coming out. Uh, it continues, this was actually from my, Wolfgang Smith's first book, The Quantum Enigma, and then he goes on and it says, it is likewise follows that creation is not in reality sequential. As we read in Ecclesiasticus, he that liveth in eternity created all things at once. There is an end. Then says Phileo Judeus to the idea that the universe came into being in six days, and Meister Eckhart puts it a little bit more plainly, God makes the world and all things in the present now, declares the German master. Multiplicity, it turns out, pertains not to the creative act, but to the created order. In terms of our icon, it pertains not to the center, but to the circumference. And there is uh, now another book that came to my attention uh, not long ago. I was pleasantly surprised. I haven't been able to get a copy of this, but I was able to look uh, at the table of contents of Wolfgang's deeper thought and uh, on Meister Eckhart, and things jump out at me right away. The Kabbalistic exegesis, Christian Kabbalah, Eckhart's Trinitarian non-dualism, all these things make so much sense now as I'm beginning to understand more and more um, really what was going on. Like I was telling you in the uh, first time we talked about, Eckhart commented more than any medieval on the Jewish philosopher Moses Maimonides. Now, Maimonides is analogous to Thomas Aquinas in a sense that he was very Aristotelian. So he was a tool for Eckhart, Eckhart to make his point, especially with apophatic theology, which is, neg- which is you know, what is God not? And therefore, um, he was using Maimonides as, as others, maybe, um, but he quoted him a lot, and it was very interesting. Another thing that happened in the Dominican order in uh, the year 1240 was there was a Dominican monk convert. He was a Jew. His name was Nicholas Donin. And, you know, in the Talmud, there's these descriptions of Jesus that are really not Jesus, but they're Yeshu Hanotsri and Yeshu Ben Stada. And this has been a, a tremendous uh, um, problem for the Jews because of these stories in the Talmud and comment. And this was a lot of the things what the Roman church would persecute. And this is why the Jews were very much, you know, wandering from around uh, the, the old Holy Roman Empire, being thrown out of countries, and there was lots of forced conversions. So, you know, the church was very angry against the way that they per so-called presented Jesus, which was found in the Talmud. And this Nicholas Donin converted to be a Dominican monk from, from Judaism, and then he put these rabbis on trial. So there was lots of Talmudic burnings and Jewish literature burnings in those days. But it's very interesting to note that uh, lots of these things now are coming out that you know the Ashkenazi Hasidim Jews who, who were in the Middle Ages, and this was the time when the Zohar and many of these Kabbalistic uh, Oral traditions were put into writing, and there's been a lot of things just coming out in recent years of Meister Eckhart's thought and congruency with Ashkenazi Hasidic Judaism. It's interesting when I was uh, um, one of the channels I follow is uh, this is Zevi, and he's he's interviewed uh, John Vervaki, and he's interviewed um, a number of many different people from other religions. Uh, he li- you know he's based in Israel, uh, I think he's from Chabad, but he's, he's a wonderful. wonderful he's a wonderful channel. teacher. You know who he is then. Yeah, but he talks really fast. <laughs> He's really fast. Okay, yeah. Just like my Joe. Okay, so you know Zebi. So Zebi, you know, when he teaches on the Kabbalah here, I mean, that diagram he begins with is very much, you know, the infinity, but the creative act into, you know, as God creates uh, out of himself. And and this is how he's explaining the Kabbalah as he begins to do it. He does a very good explanation of it. So so it kind of looks like Wolfgang Smith's icon here. <laughs> That's what I'm kind of getting at. So we're seeing something coming together here. Very interesting. Uh, so it kind of comes out, you know, I told you I'd look a little bit. I don't really want to 
this often this is a whole you know a whole seminar in itself and i I'm, I'm not an authority on this by no means but but some of the little things i've gleaned already you know and i want to just always bring it to the simplistic which relates to eckhart first of all kabbalah simply means received it's the received therefore this oral torah which was given to moses is at par with the pentateuch or the scriptures that were written down um, I'm in constant research, you know, of, of this arguments. There's many of these historical scholars that say that basically the Jews stole from Plato in the Maccabean period, you know, because that's where we have the textual receipts. That's where the paper trail ends. And we know that, you know, vellum and parchments and even papyrus are things that are, uh, <laughs> you know, not easily preservable. Uh, rocks, you know, stone tablets. This is a lot better. But the Jews, I mean, we have to affirm the oral tradition. Our culture's the cultures and people before us, I mean, even today, people, Muslims memorize the whole Quran. What's what's the wrong with memorization in our TikTok age? I mean, our, you know, ADD is kicked in really on steroids now. I mean, I'm, I'm getting worse. My wife tells me all the time. But uh, in one way, the oral tradition is also affirmed throughout um, the traditions. And but it wasn't something made public. It was something that was disclosed in a very careful way when people were taught, especially rabbis. And, and when we talk about Hasidic, Jews, you know, th there's various ages to it, but they're basically the Pharisees. And when we talk about Jews in the Bible, uh, they were the, the ones who so-called killed Jesus were, were the Pharisees. We're not the Pharisees, in a sense. They were, they were who? They were the Sadducees, and they were the, the secularists. They were the politically aligned with the Edomian Herod Herodians. And so there's a lot to unpack there, but I don't want to get sidetracked. But when I look at this interpretation uh, structure, this is one part of Kabbalah. That's very important. Peshat is this plain, simple meaning of the text. You know, when we read the Bible, what does it say? Uh, the Torah and these so many things we can just read and it says it straight. We understand it. We don't need to interpret it. You know, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Let there be light. Okay, so we know. Uh, Remez is interesting. This is where Meister Eckhart gets a lot of his scope for his allegorical teaching. You know, this is uh, what he's using when he's talking about Martha being you know, uh, Mary choosing the greater part, but how, do, how does he stand that on its head and bring Martha out to the forefront? Well, it's through Ramez. Derash is, is very interesting, too, because it's the Jews commented on everything, Midrash, so they were always preaching the text. So for, for some of these things that there, there's, uh, you know, these things could be considered upon the Oral Torah, but it's not necessarily the Oral Torah. The Oral Torah relates a lot to procedures, in, because Judaism is really an observant religion. It's not a propositional religion, in the most part, it's a lifestyle. And so, you know, how do you kill an animal with not giving him too much pain? So that entails describing how knife sharpening should be. You know, you can sharpen a knife in, in a way that might be too sharp, or you can sharpen a knife where it might be too dull and it hurts the animal when you slaughter it. So, you know, you know, know with all the kosher foods and also this pertains to Islam uh, in, in, with halal. I mean, these things, the, the Noahic context of Judaism is very important to understand because it, it entails all of creation. And then there's Sod, and this is the secret mystery. This is where the, the messianic dimension comes out. And, and this whole messianism in Judaism is something we misunderstand in, in, in Christianity to a large extent. And so that's another whole story in itself. So 